Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Washington State University's third in our series of public information sessions for parents and supporters of first time WCU students coming to Pullman. My name is Phil Weiler. I'm Vice President for Marketing and Communications here at WSU, and I'm excited that we have, have, have the opportunity to be in front of you today. We have uh, close to 1,700 people who have RSVP'd, which is wonderful. Uh, we also asked you to do homework, and you all not only did your homework, you did extra credit. We have over 1,000 questions that people have submitted, so that's wonderful. It's really helpful for us to get an idea of what kinds of questions and concerns you have. It allows us to really make sure we try and address those to the degree that we can. Obviously, we're not going to get through all 1,000 questions in one hour, um, but like I say, we do know based on categorization what kinds of things people are concerned about. If you um, aren't hearing us answer a question that you have, don't forget that we do have the chat function live in YouTube. Uh, we have a small army of volunteers who are subject matter experts who are gonna be watching that chat and trying to answer those questions. I'll tell you that the chat goes fast and furious when we've got this many people connecting online. So um, they will do their best to catch those questions and get you answers um, live and in real time. And then the third option is if you still end up having questions or you've got something specific you wanna ask like you know, options for deferrals or questions about intercampus enrollment, those kinds of things, I'd encourage you to go to our, um, our email address, future.coog at wsu.edu. Again, that's future.coog at wsu.edu. Um, that's monitored by our enrollment team. Um, they are promising to get answers to you as quickly as possible. Uh, and so a good, a good resource for you to keep in mind. So today we've got um, four of our campus leaders who are gonna be talking to us about a variety of subjects. We're gonna be talking about things like health and wellness, housing and residence life, fraternity and sorority life, student life in general, and academic planning and support. So with that, let me introduce our four speakers and we can go ahead and get started. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bonnie DeVries, uh, MD. She's the medical director for our Cougar Health Services. She also happens to be one of the incident commanders for our COVID-19 response. So has a really good sense of what WSU has been doing for more than six months now. I was actually doing the math in my head earlier today and Washington State University started ramping up for, in advance of COVID-19, actually before it was even called COVID-19. And that was back in January. So here we are now a full six months since we had our first communication to students around, around the coronavirus and COVID-19. We're also joined by Dr. Mary Wack. Mary is Vice Provost for Academic Engagement and Student Success. Welcome, Mary. Uh, also, we have Dr. Therese King. Therese is Executive Director of University Advising. She's also the Director of the Academic Success and Career Center. Um, I've said this on previous uh, information sessions, but that is a place that you wanna make sure your students are aware of. It is the place to go if they have questions, if they have concerns, if they're having um, challenges academically, that it, or if they're preparing for a job, it's also the place for them to go. So keep that in mind, Academic Success and Career Center. And then finally, we're joined by Dr. Jill Creighton. Jill is Associate Vice President and Dean of Students in the Division of Student Life, or excuse me, Student Affairs. Um, Jill, I'd like to start with you. I know that we had sent out some information to parents and students just yesterday regarding housing and dining. And I think it's probably a good opportunity for us just to remind folks about what was in that information that was sent out. Thank you, Phil. Um, and thank you all Kook families for joining us today. I am glad to be able to give significantly more concrete information today than we've done in previous parent forums. Just last week on Wednesday afternoon, we were given the guidance we needed from Governor Inslee to return to limited in-person instruction this fall. It is a privilege for us to be able to reopen in this unprecedented time, and we are keeping our students' education and health and safety at the top of our minds as we're making some very difficult decisions. 
we have been considering all the ways that WSU can comply with the governor's directives for higher education, and we've made a series of decisions to align with those requirements. Students will be required to comply with a variety of shifting public health directives, including, but not limited to, wearing a mask, you can see my background, proper hand sanitization, physical distancing, travel restrictions, and limited use of shared spaces. We do expect students to affirm daily that they are feeling well enough to be in the classroom or involved in other university activities. And students can expect additional information and training on what to do as we get closer to the first day of classes. If your student cannot or will not follow the rules, we are not the institution for you this fall. Some states are already preventing travel and imposing quarantine requirements, and we are expecting that this may impact WSU. We don't know yet what August will bring, and we will let you know as soon as we get closer to moving. If you know that you live in an area with high transmission, please be aware that there may be additional restrictions for your arrival to Pullman. Uh, we did announce yesterday some very difficult decisions for on-campus student residence halls, and it's not a decision we made lightly. Again, we are working towards the best options for the health of our students and community while honoring our state's expectation that we house first-year students. Some of you earned college credit as high school students, whether it be AP or Running Start or another way. If this was you, I want to own we made a mistake and we sent you the wrong message about your housing initially, and you should receive a second outreach for our housing team, and you will be included in that first time first year student group. If for some reason you don't hear from us, let us know at housing at wsu.edu. Priority housing will be given to first time first year students, and the majority of students will be housed in single residence hall rooms. If space allows, we'll be able to house some returning students in our residence halls and students who need assistance transitioning to off-campus housing, those are mostly our sophomore and above students, can set up a time with our team of housing transition coaches and that's through the office of the Dean of Students. You can find us online at deanofstudents.wsu.edu or email deanofstudents at wsu.edu. I wanna make a few notes on the housing decisions. Uh, first time first year students have always been expected to live in on-campus residence during their first two semesters. This expectation has been in place for at least the past two decades. And in order to keep consistent operations and maintenance, including keeping our buildings open, functioning, powered, sanitized and cleaned, and paying our teams that do that critical work to support our students, housing contracts have always been for the full academic year and will continue to be so next year. Last spring, even as we transitioned to the distance learning environment, our residence halls remained open to keep our students with critical and emergency needs housed. Again, we know this is very challenging, which is why we wanted to give you some time to consider what's best for you and your family. We want you here at WSU Pullman, and we know that you need to do what's right for you. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope I can offer some more clarity to many of the questions that you have about starting at WSU this fall. Great, thank you, Jill. A lot of information there. Um, parents and supporters, uh, don't forget there was an email that was sent out. I'd encourage you to take a look at it again um, if you need a little bit more information about what Jill just shared with us. You know, it's worth noting, Jill, you talked about the fact that Governor Jay Inslee just a week ago last Thursday did um, come up with the guidelines that we need to reopen uh, in a higher education environment. So that was, uh, it's worth noting, I think that was something we were all waiting for um, anxiously to make sure the plans we had in place were gonna be consistent with what the governor had in mind. I think the good news is that the plans we made um, were very consistent. So I think we're in a good place and um, should be ready to have face-to-face -face instruction in the fall. Um, with that, I'd actually like to move on to uh, Therese if I could. Therese, I know we are um, entering the, the, the season of Alive and uh, most people know what that means, but could you share with us, for people who are not quite sure what Alive is, give us some details about that, and then also maybe talk about um, what our thoughts are on the week of welcome. Sure, thanks, Phil. Um, yes, the Alive program, we're actually halfway through our Alive season this summer. We've already welcomed um, several thousand students and parents um, to our campus and our operations in terms of uh, online, to, to our campus online at this point. Um, and a lot of the Alive activities, it's orientation based. Um, we want to make sure that students and parents are learning more about WSU and um, for many of you, we recognize that you've 
you haven't visited campus before, um, but we want to make sure that we're introducing the resources that are here to help you succeed. And so a lot of the ALIVE program is about the offices and the people that are here to help you, to answer your questions, um, the resources that are available here when students are here in the fall, um, such as tutoring or advising or campus life, how to get involved on campus. Um, so the ALIVE program is really packed with about two and a half days worth of material um, that we go through online. Um, and again, we have sessions all throughout after the fourth here, we'll have an additional um, set of sessions that we'll have um, for students and for parents. Uh, there's some pre um, pre-recorded sessions that go out that parents and students have access to all summer long, not just during the ALIVE program. So we recognize there's a lot of information there that we're giving you. And if you want to go back and look at that information, or if it brings up other questions, we have um, certainly people who can answer those questions that you didn't think of while you were going through the program. As far as the last ALIVE session, that's our fall ALIVE session, and that happens the week before classes begin. And that session right now is for students who couldn't go through any of the previous 11 sessions that we've had throughout the summer. So, uh, and then that leads us right into the week of welcome. And the week of welcome is the opportunity for the university to um, share again, uh, more activities. We want to, during the ALIVE program, really focus on what you need to know right at that moment. But the week of welcome, we recognize that, you know, you're about to start your classes in a week. And so we really kind of shift our focus during that time, um, welcoming all students back, our new students and our returning students who are here, um, ways to start building the community and getting to know each other, ways to get to introduce to your academic colleges and your professors, um, you know, just get settled by moving in. Um, that's all part of the week of welcome, as well as some fun activities that we hope that will help you get to know each other um, and learn more about the WSU community. Great, thank you, Therese. Um, Mary, I'd like to have you talk a little bit about uh, what fall is gonna look like, um, particularly from an academic perspective. What are the classroom settings gonna be? We know that um, our intent is to do face-to-face -to, -face to the extent that we can, but we're obviously not gonna be um, having classrooms in the same configuration that they have been in the past. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, Phil. Happy to share what we've been working on pretty intensively for the last month. And uh, if you don't mind, I will share my screen with you and um, take a look at some of the considerations that have gone into putting together a fall schedule for the Pullman campus. So as Jill mentioned, we have had to observe the um, state and uh, the state guidelines, and those have only been available in the last week. With that, we have to look at our over 800 instructors. How will they be safe? Are they able to teach face-to-face -face, or do they need to teach from a distance? And then we take a look at over 200 instructional spaces and uh, we have to go through each one and make sure there's proper ventilation, that the entrances and exits uh, don't crowd people too much and that the students are seated at appropriate distances from each other and from the instructor. And so we take all of that and spin the gears with over 2000 scheduled sections and we come up with a fall schedule. But I wanted to give you just this example of what a reconfigured classroom might look like. This uh, had held a class of 40, but once we take out the extra seats, it's now a class of 15. So we have to find a new room for the class of 40, likely in a room that used to seat 100. Uh, but those 15 are going to be lucky students because they will have the opportunity of a very tight experience with a small class that you might typically find more at a liberal arts type college. And they'll have the opportunity to uh, develop a rapport with the professor and vice versa 
that would be harder to come by in a much larger class. So we think there's some upsides to how we have had to reconfigure the space. So the calendar, I know there are questions about that. First of all, no change to the public published calendar. Starts and ends on the published dates, and we are not changing any holidays. The one change is that after Thanksgiving break, um, all the face-to-face -face components will be moved online. Now, I know a lot of families are hinging some decisions on the mix of distance courses and face-to-face -face courses that their student has signed up for. And uh, the date of the final schedule is eagerly anticipated. Uh, between July 15th and 20th, the near final schedule will be available online in this Pullman schedule of classes. And the final version will be the end of July. But I wanna give you a little bit of preview of what that's gonna look like. First, I wanna say though, that no matter whether the course will be face-to-face, -face, whether it will be completely at a distance or fully online, whether it's a mix of face-to-face -face and some kind of technologies, we are really looking at providing the best educational experience in that modality. So for the Pullman campus, we're gonna have a variety of course modes available. There will be a significant number of fully face-to-face -face courses. Um, my estimate is about one third of the curriculum will be face-to-face. There will be another significant fraction. And again, I'm estimating about a third, maybe more, will be a mix of face-to-face -face and distance technologies. So for example, a class that had been, let's say 125 students, they will not be able to meet as a group, but they could be broken down into smaller groups. Group A meets Monday, group B meets Tuesday, group C meets, or, or Wednesday, Group C meets Friday. And so they are able to meet face to face with the instructor, but at the same time, they do work online as well. And then there will be some courses that will be fully distance, by which I mean they will have a scheduled time, but they won't have a place. And then the fully online courses will be anytime, anywhere, no scheduled time, no scheduled place. Now, some questions came in, um, are all the freshmen gonna have the online courses? Uh, no, there will be a mix of courses of every type at every level. It's gonna vary, but that mix will be available uh, to all students depending on their discipline and their major. So if I had to predict, I think when the near final schedule comes out that most Pullman New students will likely have at least two courses that have substantial face-to-face -face elements. And one last point, please don't forget the many clubs and activities offered on the Pullman campus. I know from talking to the departments and the colleges that they are really preparing a lot of interesting experiences for new students coming in. Um, and please remember that clubs and activities are ways for personal growth. They're opportunities for professional development, there are opportunities for fun, and a great way to find friends and connect on campus. So thanks, Phil. Mary, thanks for that comment at the end about the, the clubs and activities. I know that I've seen a number of questions uh, people have submitted um, asking about, you know, does this mean my, my student is gonna be stuck in their residence hall room by themselves? taking classes online, not meeting anybody. And I think it's important to note that one of, the, one of the real benefits of having a residential experience is that opportunity to get to know people outside the classroom um, and the learning that takes place outside the classroom in addition to what takes place in the classroom. So those clubs and activities definitely are gonna be, uh, I think, important to students. So thanks for that. Um, finally, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Bonnie DeVries. Um, Bonnie, there's a lot to talk about that people uh, want to hear about. I think there's a lot of COVID-19 questions people have about what is attestation? What does that mean? How are we going to deal with um, students who may have illness? I'd love to have you cover that. But I also think that in any normal year, in my experience at least, parents do have a lot of concern about the physical health, mental health of their students. And 
I'd love maybe before we jump into COVID-19, can you talk a little bit about what is Cougar Health Services? What kinds of services are being provided? Where are you physically located on campus? How far does it take, you know, do students have to go if they need to interact with you and your team? I would love to talk about Cougar Health. Thank you, Phil. Um, so because Pullman is a rural area, Cougar Health provides um, a much more uh, robust set of medical services than you might expect at a university health center. Uh, we are right on campus in the Washington building and we have a full service primary care clinic where even before COVID, we were doing lots of urgent care. Uh, last fall, I think we did around 5,000 visits just for respiratory uh, illnesses. Um, and we also uh, provide mental health care. We provide contraception and sexual health uh, preventive services. We provide chronic disease management for students that need that and it's appropriate for the primary care setting. We also have a pharmacy on the same floor with the medical clinic so that students can get their medications filled right here and they don't need to leave campus for that. Also within Cougar Health, we have our counseling and psychological services department. Uh, we have a vision clinic and we have our health promotion unit, which um, provides programming and outreach around health and prevention. Our doctors and nurses and physicians assistants see students by appointment during the academic year. That's six days a week that students can access that. Like other medical clinics during the pandemic, a lot of that has transitioned to telehealth and that's in an effort to protect our patients so they don't have to come into a medical clinic if they don't need to physically be seen by the doctor. And students frankly really like the telehealth visits. They like not having to get dressed and leave their dorm room <laughs> to have a doctor's visit. Um, and so we have a, a lot of services. Um, we, it's our goal that every student has access to the healthcare that they need in a manner that's consistent with their values. And that's been our goal since before COVID. Of course, COVID makes that a little bit more complicated. And so we've um, increased and changed a lot of our infection control measures to be consistent with all of the CDC and Department of Health guidance. and. Um, people might be interested to know that our center is also accredited by the AAAHC, which is the same body that accredits any um, outpatient medical clinic or surgical center. Not all college health centers can say that. Um, and we have the same standards that you might find in, say, a plastic surgery office or something like that. Um, so we, I'm really proud of the service that we give to students. Thank you, Bonnie. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you for a few few more minutes if we could. Um, I did know while you were talking there were some questions in the chat having to do with insurance and how do students uh, pay for those medical services that they might be receiving from Cougar Health Services. So we do accept insurance and bill insurance for services. There are some services that are included in the student health fee. Uh, currently within the medical clinic, uh, students get one free visit a semester. For many students, that's all they need. And so they're not paying for, for that. Um, but we do bill insurance. And so whatever um, uh, benefits that students have through their insurance, they can use those here. Great. Can you now talk a little bit about COVID-19? I know that um, parents have a lot of concerns about preparations that are being made and, and uh, what can we expect in the fall with regard to preparations and what happens if someone does become ill? Sure. So one thing that I'm really proud of is the close partnerships that we have at Cougar Health with our other healthcare partners in the community, with the hospital, with uh, the Department of Health. And so um, we've been able to really work toward a safe environment and, and continue to provide care to students. We've continued to see students here in the clinic when they need it um, and see them through telehealth. We've had really good access to COVID testing here also. Um, 
uh, within our community, we've had adequate testing throughout the pandemic and not everybody has been able to say that. Of course, there are some circumstances um, that are outside of our control, but we actually expect our access to testing to improve significantly shortly. Um, we have a lab right on campus um, that's going to be opening as a state COVID testing lab. And so we expect to have um, the most rapid testing we can. Um, I could literally walk up the street and drop off the sample if I needed it right away. <laughs> um, so we're gonna have very rapid testing here and that that's super important. Um, one other thing that I'm really proud of at Cougar Health is what great access we have to students. It's very rare that we can't get a student in the same day. We do require appointments. We don't do walk-ins, um, but we're able to see all the students that need to be seen. And during the pandemic, I think the two things that are the most important when it comes to controlling this, uh, this pandemic from, from the healthcare sector anyway, is being able to rapidly diagnose and test and, and then do contact tracing. And so with contact tracing, anybody who has tested positive, we identify those people that have been close contacts that may also have the infection. And so we can isolate it quickly. And we have through that partnership with uh, the Whitman County Public Health Department, we've um, amped up the contact tracing capacity um, here in Pullman, our environmental health and safety partners on campus are doing that. And so, um, so we are continuing to uh, work toward expanding testing capacity and contact tracing capacity as much as we can. It's really important that when any campus member starts to feel sick at all, the moment they think they have any symptoms that they call. Uh, we only see students, of course, so students need to call Cougar Health right away if they think they have a fever or they think they have a cough, um, and we can get them in and get them tested. And then for those who are positive, um, we can make sure that that's not being spread to others as well. Thanks, Bonnie. Two things you mentioned there that I, th I think are really important to, to reiterate. One is the, the fact that we will be able to be tested, uh, processing samples on our own campus here, literally, literally within the next couple of days. We've been working very closely with the Washington Department of Health. Uh, we have a lab on campus that is able to do that work. Um, and working with the state, we were able to get that up and running to be able to, to uh, really significantly increase capacity, not just for Washington State University here at Pullman, but really for um, the eastern part of the state of Washington. So that's, that's great news for us. The other thing that you mentioned was the idea of contact tracers. And um, again, I, you talked about the partnership we have with Whitman County Public Health. I think that that's really important. I know that we talk with our colleagues at Whitman County Public Health weekly, if not daily, um, and have been doing that literally, I think since, you know, if we sent our first message to students in January, I think we were in touch with County Public Health in February, and we've been meeting with them on a regular basis ever since. Um, you know, as Bonnie mentioned, we have about a half a dozen environmental health and safety uh, officials from Washington State University who have been trained by Whitman County Public Health to serve as contact tracers. The advantage is not only are they um, folks who are knowledgeable in that field, but they know our campus intimately and really can uh, make sure that we get the, that contact tracing done really quickly. Um, I'm gonna switch along in the same vein, but switch to Jill if I could. Um, Jill, one question as a, as a piggyback on that and then a separate question for you, but what happens if a student does end up um, needing to be uh, isolated? Can you talk about what that's going to look like? Because um, I think I know the answer to that question, uh, but also I want you to talk a little bit about the fact that since most of our rooms are going to be single occupancy instead of double occupancy, I'm seeing a couple different comments in the chat section with people asking, what does that mean for the cost of the room? Are you paying the cost of a single occupancy room or a double? But let's start by, if you could answer that question about if someone becomes ill, whether it's COVID-19 or something else, and they need to be isolated, what are the options for them? So I'm gonna start with the billing question first on the rates. And the rates for our uh, single rooms are probably the best deal in the Pac-12. 
Uh, our single rooms are only $200 more per semester uh, compared to our double rooms. And so we do plan to build single rooms at the single rate, uh, but again, it's only $200 more a semester and that will be available. Uh, I know that our chat team has been pasting the link to the rates. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask them to do that now so you can see. Um, but to answer your question related to students who may become ill with symptoms of COVID-19 or other upper respiratory symptoms, we're gonna be following the directives of our health officials and our medical providers as to whether or not that student needs to be isolated. We do have an isolation plan in place and a designated space for students who are feeling ill uh, and need to isolate to go to. That will include everything from meal delivery for those students to uh, help with laundry if needed. And so we do have a team in place that is ready to help with that. One of the things we've done on campus for many years is allow students to order delivery to the residence hall room through our dining services. And it's a, an app called the Get app or the Get Food app. You can find that in your uh, Android Play Store or also in your Apple uh, Play Store. So if you wanna uh, log on to that and take a look, download that, and that will be the app through which students who are isolated will be able to ensure that their basic needs are met. Our isolation space also includes a bathroom. And so folks will be able to have all of their needs met in that one space. Great, thank you. I, one of the things that you mentioned, Jill, I think is worth reiterating is that there are services available for students. Whatever their need is, we have folks who are, who are gonna be trained to help you. The reason I bring that up, I, I was thinking about this earlier today when I was getting prepared for our, for our session. Uh, and I, I, I recalled a, a situation I had in my own family where my nephew several years ago was going to another university here in the state and he was feeling ill and he was a, you know, he was a young adult and he was going to take care of himself and he knew that he was starting to get pretty ill and he needed to go, go to urgent care. So he got up at two o'clock in the morning, put on his clothes, walked through the rain to the local hospital and, and went to urgent care. And which was great that he was taking care of himself, but I just had to say, Michael, you had a residence advisor in your building. You should not have had to go do that by yourself. We have, you know, every university is going to have uh, systems and, and, and structures in place to help students. So if a student ever has a question, I would encourage them to reach out and get help because chances are we have people who are being paid specifically to help students with that particular question. So with that in mind, I'm going to switch over to Therese now, if I could. Speaking of people who have questions, I did see several questions that were pre-submitted that had to do with things like academic advising, um, trying to figure out what is my schedule or what is my student schedule going to look like in the fall. And because um, we can talk about what that looks like and, and also what happens if people aren't quite sure what they want their major to be. What are, what are the options available for them? Sure. Those are definitely common questions that we get um, from parents and students. And um, as far as resources that are available, I'll start there, resources available um, to students, whether it be in the summer or fall. Um, academic advising happens throughout the entire year, um, calendar year. And um, during the ALIVE program, our new students are academically advised by an advisor from the department or area of interest that they have. Um, if they're interested in nursing, they're going to meet with a pre-nursing advisor. If they're interested in engineering, they'll meet with an engineering advisor. And we do have professional staff that specifically work with students who are deciding on their major. Um, and we know oftentimes that students when they applied to Washington State told us they wanted to major in X, but over the next four or five months, they've changed their mind. And during the ALIVE program, we have students that will change their mind the night before as to what their major is. And so again, we have professional staff ready to work with students and talk with them about what their interests are and help them navigate really the selection of classes for their first semester um, at WSU. Uh, the, the academic advisors, like I said, will meet one-on-one -on -one with a student during the ALIVE program, and then the student will get contact information as to who their advisor is. We do require advising for our new students, and so they'll get that contact information if they have questions that they think of after they are finished with the ALIVE session. They can always contact that person throughout the summer um, or into the fall as they begin. 
Um, we also have a, a variety of resources that are available to help students as they navigate into their first uh, semester of classes. Um, the Academic Success and Career Center offers free tutoring um, to students in their lower division courses, 100 and 200 level courses. Um, we have peer tutoring and we've always done tutoring both in person as well as online. Um, so if students are unable to, or maybe they want to just, you know, stay at their computer in their residence and um, ask questions, they can certainly work with a tutor through an online format as well. Um, we offer academic coaching and a lot of our new students and some of our returning students will um, meet with an academic coach. That person is really there to help the student really hone in on the skills that will make them successful. Um, those things like time management, um, note taking, test taking, if a student has test anxiety, um, those sorts of things. And those uh, peers are also trained and graduate students are really trained to make referrals around campus um, if the student maybe needs some additional assistance um, in those areas. Um, we also help students find a job, and I wanted to mention that because I did notice some questions coming out about will you have jobs for students in the, the fall. Um, we absolutely do. We really rely on our student staffs around campus to help us deliver the services, and we also recognize that peers are often asked the questions before the professional staff may be asked the question. And so we use a platform called Handshake. And um, if, if students want to look, all students have access to Handshake um, through ASCC and our website is ASCC.wsu.edu. Um, and I would encourage students who are interested in picking up a part-time job either on or off campus to check out the Handshake website probably about two weeks before classes begin. And that's when many of the postings will go online for students to look at. Terrific, thanks, Therese. Mary, I did see um, another set of questions that I think you might be able to help ad address for us. There have been a couple parents who are concerned about uh, their students who may have pre-existing medical conditions, and there's a concern about whether being in a congregate setting is a good idea for those students. Can you talk a little bit about um, Global Campus, what that is, and, and how the, the hybrid model of a face-to-face -face and distance learning is similar or different to uh, the global campus experience? And you know, what, what does that global campus experience include for students? Sure, happy to do so. Uh, the global campus was originally created to serve as a place for degree completion for working adults. So it is completely online, but at the same time, it has all the services that Therese King has talked about in terms of academic support and student support for students to thrive. They even have uh, clubs and activities for their online students. So it is um, characterized as an anywhere, anytime curriculum. The faculty check in with the students and the students sometimes have uh, meetings among themselves or synchronous uh, same time meetings with each other for various projects. But by and large, it is a, um, a self-paced kind of academic environment. And so students who do very well in the global campus are ones who have fairly well developed time management skills and are able to be uh, independent learners pretty successfully. Now, on the Pullman campus, <clears throat> we do have um, distance courses that students may take away from campus. And I think the question that families are trying to sort through is, will I have uh, enough of a schedule with the Pullman campus that I can study at a distance with the available offerings for Pullman, or do I need to think about um, signing up with a global campus? So let me talk through a couple of different scenarios that you might think about. Um, we have um, uh, the opportunity to uh, have students 
pick up courses, additional courses in winter session online or in summer session. So perhaps a student can pull together three or four courses at a distance or fully online through the Pullman course schedule and then say, you know, I am going to plan on taking a winter session course online or save those three credits for next summer. And then when I'm a sophomore, I will be fully up to the 30 credits for an entering student. Similar kind of scenario, perhaps the student has a lot of college in the high school running start AP credit. Perhaps uh, four courses is enough and the student qualifies for financial aid. 12 credits uh, is a full load and the student then wouldn't need to take five credits but could study at home through the Pullman distance or online courses. We are also exploring another option and uh, perhaps at a future forum, I can say a little more about that, but that is basically to share in a more seamless uh, manner, the online or distance courses at the different campuses. So a student could be a Pullman student but be able to piggyback, as it were, on a distance course from the Vancouver campus or the Tri-Cities campus. We have a few things to work out, but all the campuses are really dedicated to solving this problem for our students because we know it really matters to the families and the students. So we hope to be able to tell you more uh, in a week or so when we have a few more of the logistics worked out there. Thanks, Mary. I'm actually glad you mentioned the fact that uh, we do have other campuses. I think a lot of times we focus um, on the campus where our student is going to, but um, it's important to remember that we do have a total of six campuses, the five physical campuses across the state of Washington, as well as the global campus. And um, it is something for parents and, and students to think about if they're concerned about being in a congregate setting where um, living on campus may not be a good solution and a student might live closer to another campus, they might look at uh, enrolling in that other campus. So something for them to think about. The other thing that you mentioned, which I think is, is worth uh, uh, reiterating is the fact that Washington State University actually has many decades of experience in this idea of distance learning. We were one of the first universities in the country to really embrace this idea of distance learning. And the reason that's important is when we had to make that switch from face-to-face -face learning to online, that really wasn't a, that wasn't as jarring a change for us as it was for other institutions that just didn't have that history and that background. Um, we know that the majority of our faculty members prior to COVID-19 already had experience teaching courses online. So for them, it was uh, something they were familiar with. And we also knew that virtually all of our students prior to COVID-19 were graduating with at least one uh, global campus or online course. So again, for them, the students were familiar with it, the faculty were familiar with it. And the other piece that I think is worth noting is that uh, in addition to having that, that experience with distance learning, we actually have a whole system of, uh, of uh, academic trainers who can help faculty members make that switch from face-to-face -face instruction to online. So um, that I think is the beauty of us looking at this hybrid model, this high flex model where I sort of see it as a, as a as a slider from one extreme of totally face-to-face -to, -face to the other extreme of um, totally online, but we can really kind of set that where we need them to be based on what the situation is on any particular campus. And we do know that um, not, every, never, not every county in the state is in the same place in the reopening process. And so that experience with distance learning and that ability through the high flex model, I think is gonna serve the students well. Um, as we navigate what the fall is going to look like. Uh, next, I'd like to move on to, um, let me see, who do I have next on my list? Um, Bonnie, can you talk to us just a little bit about what happens if a student becomes ill? How are parents notified? You know, students are for the most part over 18. What does that look like? Because I've seen several parents asking that question about, how do I find out if my student isn't feeling well? That's a really great question that we get quite a lot. Um, 
because of the legal requirements to maintain confidentiality, things like HIPAA and the Washington Uniform Healthcare Information Act, um, we encourage the student to be the one to tell their family about their health. Um, Typically, when a student is being told that they need to isolate or quarantine by Cougar Health, we do say to them, would you like to go home for this? You don't, you don't have to do that here. That's up to you. Um, despite those confidentiality requirements, I am a family doctor, and I do see all of my patients as a member of their family. And we recognize that um, for many of our students, when they come to Cougar Health, it's the first time they've ever accessed healthcare on their own. And so it's pretty typical that they want to involve their family members in what's going on. And so it's my practice, the practice of many of our providers here to say to those students, hey, why don't you call your family member right now while we're together in this exam room and I can answer their questions. And so we have the student invite that family member into the conversation. There are, of course, uh, uh, there's a paperwork process that can be done so that the student can give consent and we can have a conversation without the student present, but it's always better to, um, to have the student present anyway, just to um, encourage them to understand how to access their healthcare better. There certainly are those rare exceptions when we have severe um, illnesses or injuries and we have patients that are students that are hospitalized and then uh, Jill's office, the Dean of Students office can get involved and, and help those students and, and communicate with families. But primarily, most of the time we're encouraging those students to bring the family member into the conversation. Thank you, that's good information for parents. Um, Jill, I'd like to go to you next. Um, talk a little bit about our housing contract. I, I see a number of comments in the chat section about people asking about the addendum. Um, there's questions about when people are going to get more information about um, you know, if they have a roommate or if they wanted to get a roommate, um, all that kind of stuff. Can you, can you just give us a little bit more detail about the contract itself? Yes. Uh, so the addendum that was uh, sent out uh, yesterday for our students that return it by Sunday, July 12th at 1159 PM uh, and our first year students, those students will receive their residence hall assignments no later than Friday, July 17th. So again, July 12th at 1159 PM is when the addendum is due for first time first year students, as well as any students wanting to return to the residence halls. And those students in the first time first year grouping will go ahead and receive their housing assignments by July 17th. I also see in the chat that folks are very concerned about the decision. And so I'm gonna elucidate that just a little bit here. Uh, as I mentioned in the opening, our residence hall contracts have always been for an entire academic year. And the addendum was meant to highlight this for students as well as to make sure that you all understood that we are not able to offer emergency refunds or credits as we did last spring if we need to move online mid-semester or mid-year. Otherwise, our normal cancellation and termination, or termination policies will apply. And we're communicating as transparently as possible to ensure that all families know exactly what you're agreeing to in our residence hall contract. In a best case scenario, we are face to face all year. We do not want to have to close due to COVID. We want our coops here. And we want you uh, to make the best decision that's right for your family. We know this puts folks in a very difficult position and it's a difficult choice to make. And again, this is so you understand exactly what the situation will be. Uh, I know folks have questions around Thanksgiving uh, in terms of moving to remote instruction for the last two weeks of term. Our halls will not close. Our halls will remain open. Uh, and this is our historical practice as well. We don't close over breaks, so students have a place to live all year. Thanks, Jill. I know that that is a, it's a tough choice that we had to make. I, you know, I think it's, for me, it helps to remember that the reason that we exist as an institution, we're a public uh, research university, we exist to provide the best possible education to the most number of students at the lowest possible price. And whenever there is anything that's going to be a burden to students or their families, um, particularly if they're financial burdens, those are things we really we, we, we agonize over before we make decisions. And so um, thanks for addressing that head on. I, I appreciate that. Um, I'd like now, if I could, to move on to Therese. Um, we talked a little bit about registering for classes. Can you talk a little bit more about students who have um, 
transfer credits. I know you, you mentioned it earlier in the, um, before, but I've seen a number of questions about whether it's running start. Um, could you explain first of all what that is? If you're a parent who's not from Washington, we may not be, they may not be, may not be familiar with that concept, but the idea of AP credits, uh, um, advanced placement credits, how do those come into play? What does that mean for a student? Um, is there anything that parents need to be aware of if they have students who have either running start or AP credits? Sure. Um, so Running Start is a program um, in the state of Washington where students can, while they're in high school, can take college courses. Um, and some students will, will do that maybe their junior or senior year in combination with the high school classes that they're taking. So it fulfills the high school requirement um, for English or foreign language or um, something that the student might be doing in high school, but then also gives them college credit. Um, so if a student is bringing in either Running Start credit or uh, if they've taken AP exams and we know our AP test scores are going to, exam scores are go going to be reaching the university um, anytime now. Typically the first part of July is when the university will get that. We want to make sure stu students are sending us transcripts from their colleges or universities that they've attended um, whether it be through a Running Start program or whether it be post uh, high school for those that are transfer students. Um, Cambridge credits, international baccalaureate, CLEP exams, anything that the student has done that they will get um, they will get college credit for, we take that into consideration in the advising process. And we do recognize that across, certainly across the state, um, as well as out of state, that there are many institutions that may not be as accessible in terms of being able to get that physical transcript and sending it to Washington State. Um, we certainly do want final transcripts from high schools and colleges and universities, but in recognizing that because of closures and the, the circumstances with COVID, um, certainly a student can show us an unofficial transcript or even show us their registration, the class that they just finished or their grades for the class. And our academic advisors, as well as our admissions office can work with the students and help them then place into the appropriate next course, especially if the courses they took um, over the summer or in high school are really um, prerequisites for the course that they're going to be needing um, as they get into college. So um, again, the academic advisor is there to assist the students. They can look at transcripts or even um, initial transcripts that, you know, not final transcripts that we've received. Um, we can also talk students through, you know, what are really the next steps, the next courses that they should be taking. And that's all part of, again, the orientation program, the ALIVE program. Um, for our new students and our uh, transfer students as well who are new to the institution. So your advisor is really the key person that can help talk through that. Um, and we'll also give you reminders on how credits apply. Um, in some cases, you know, it may bump you into a um, taking classes as if you were a second semester student or as if you were a second year student because you may have gained so much college credit ahead of time. So I really encourage you to ask all those questions um, during the ALIVE program to talk to your advisor. And if you forget to tell your advisor um, that you have taken a, a course or um, in the AP exam, for example, you're not sure what the score is, let them know anyways that you took the AP exam in whatever topic area. What we like to do is assume success and advise you into the appropriate courses as if you received the score you needed to on that AP exam. And then when the scores come in, if we have to adjust the schedules, we'll do that at that point um, and get in touch with the student. So there's a lot of moving around of classes as we get the AP of, of uh, advising courses as we get those AP scores in or those CLEP exams or running start. Terrific, thank you. That actually, there was more to that answer than I realized there was going to be. So <laughs> that's the question. Thanks. Uh, Mary, I, first of all, I want to say thank you for giving us that um, illustration of what classrooms could look like. I think for me, it's helpful just to visually see how we might be changing things up to ensure that there's proper physical distancing in classes for those face-to-face -face classes. But one of the questions that I've seen today and, and earlier as well 
have to do with um, those classes that really do rely on some sort of some sort of face-to-face -face interaction. Those could be labs. Those could be um, music courses. Those could be fine arts courses. What's the thinking for those? How what will those look like in the fall? Yes, some of them will be translated to other modalities, some kind of distance modality, but some will be actually face to face with the appropriate safeguards. So uh, some of the labs, instead of having 20 students in the lab, will rotate cohorts of six through at any given point. Um, some of the music courses um, may have students performing online, but others may have them suitably distanced in a very large space to get the practice at ensemble playing. Um, so we are making every provision for uh, a really good mix of the face-to-face -face experience with all of the appropriate uh, sanitizing safeguards, distancing, and protocols so that everybody in the space is safe, and yet at the same time to bring that human contact in and bring those learning experiences that you can only get either hands-on or face-to-face. -face. Thank you. Teresa, I want to come back to you just for a quick second. Um, this was another question that, I, that came up having to do with a live, and I know you mentioned it earlier. Um, this parent was asking if their daughter needs to attend a live, uh, if they were not going to be ending up living on campus and instead doing classes online. Um, yes, absolutely. If the student is a Pullman campus student, whether they're taking their courses online or physically on campus, they need to participate in the ALIVE program. Our orientation program, ALIVE, is required for all incoming students, and we recognize that uh, we want to give students really the best start that they can. There's a lot of information during that program that not only covers and, and talks about the physical um, layout of the campus and helps students get familiar with that, but certainly um, the actual resources, um, academic advising, how to register for classes. Um, so if the student is attending uh, any of our other campuses, um, they all have orientation programs as well. So in general, regardless of what campus you're attending and what modality you use for that campus, um, there is an orientation program associated with it. Thank you, that's good to know. Jill, I have a question. Um, it's a health question, but it has to do with housing. I'm gonna address it to you if I can. Um, there was a parent who was wondering, it says, given that we're still very much in a pandemic, I'm concerned about the living situations in the residence halls, specifically shared residence halls, uh, dining facilities, laundry facilities, restrooms and showers. I know there's been a lot of work done on trying to address those kinds of questions. Can you give us just a, a sort of an insight into what the thinking is around how we're going to make sure that people are safe um, just doing those kind of everyday activities like laundry and showering and the like. Absolutely. This was an area where we got significant guidance from Governor Inslee. Again, that guidance came out last Wednesday. It's publicly available if anyone wants to take a look on Governor Inslee's website. Uh, but there are a couple of things that we're going to be doing to start the year that will be critical to keep our community as healthy as possible. The first is that all WSU community members will be expected to wear a cloth face covering or face mask while in any public space. So for our students and residents, that means unless you're in your own room, you will need to have a face covering on of some kind. Uh, we are going to be implementing some changes to our shared restroom facilities. For example, every other shower stall you can expect to see uh, unavailable. You can expect to see the same thing with uh, urinal spaces for restrooms. And for laundry spaces, you can expect to see sign up times in order to do laundry. One of the things we do in our residence halls is provide laundry service included in your in your fees. And so uh, what that means is that folks will just need to sign up for that slot in order to make sure that they can get their laundry done in a space that they need it to be done in. We also expect to have hand sanitizing stations in common areas, but our common areas won't be available to start the year. We won't have our shared kitchens open. We won't have our lounge spaces open. And most importantly, we will not be allowing guests to start the year. 
that's a bit of a change from our typical year. Uh, but again, this is so that we can understand who is in our spaces, especially if we need to move towards any type of contact tracing. In our dining facilities, we do expect to have uh, physical distancing. We expect to have many, many grab and go options. Uh, and we expect for students to only enter the facilities if they're feeling well. And if I could, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna probe a little bit on that question about res or dining halls in particular, because this was a specific question. We, we did talk about the idea of grab and go. You mentioned the Get app. Uh, I have the Get app on my phone. It's pretty slick. You order your food and it's just waiting for you. You walk up and grab it. So that's nice. Students should definitely check that out. Um, but there was a question specifically about dining halls and if there'd be seating in dining halls. And if so, is there gonna be physical distancing um, are you going to have the same number of seats and, and what is that? What will that look like? Those details are still being finalized. So we do have many plans in the works to encourage physical distancing in those spaces. So please keep an eye on our dining website and we will make those announcements as they become available. Great. Thank you. Um, we are at the six o'clock hour uh, time for us to, to close this particular session. I wanna thank everybody who joined us again, well over 1200 folks that I saw um, that were on the chat when I would check it. Uh, I appreciate parents take and supporters taking the time to, uh, to share their questions with us. As I mentioned, um, the chat section was very busy, lots of answers to questions there, but if there are specific questions you have that we were not able to uh, get to tonight, uh, remember that future.coog at wsu.edu is the email address that you should go to. I'll repeat that again. It's future.coog at wsu.edu. Um, our enrollment team is going to be monitoring that. They're promising to respond as quickly as possible. Uh, I imagine we'll have a lot of folks, just based on the questions we had today, We'll probably have a lot of folks who are asking questions in that uh, email address as well. So staff are gonna be monitoring it constantly and trying to get answers just as quickly as, as humanly possible. So with that, thank you all for joining us. My thanks to our panelists. I appreciate you all taking time to share your expertise with parents. As a, as a parent of three students that went to school, went to college, I remember um, even though I was working in higher ed that I just felt like I was um, sort of uh, adrift without knowing how things were happening at different institutions. So I appreciate all of you panelists for uh, giving us some insight, letting us hear from you firsthand about kinds of things that we as parents need to know uh, as our students are preparing for this exciting transition and a transition that is uh, uh, you know, a little bit fraught with the, uh, with the pandemic that we're all dealing with. So thank you to the panelists. Thank you to all of you parents and supporters for joining us. Have a great 4th of July and always go Cougs.